This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this week's episode, Jonathan is taking a look at more of the weapons from Call of Duty Warzone. And naturally, we had to show him a few cursed guns too. The Burger Town Classic. Vaguely horrific with the sort of meat texture. Oh, that's horrible. Truly horrible. If there are any other games, guns, and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comments section below. And if you'd like to help out the Royal Armouries Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, let's take a look at the weapons of Call of Duty Warzone. The Nikonov Aftermath. The AN-90, or Aftermat Nikonova even, AN-94. Here is one. We've been very fortunate to acquire uh, a fully intact example here. And suffice to say, it's extremely complicated. It's a gun inside a gun. So how, how is Call of Duty done? Well, not great, but then it's deliberate. So this is a one of the legally different designs. I don't particularly know why that's done, but um, it has been made x percent different from the real thing so just off the top of my head just the profile of the receiver is different not not wildly so there's no separate handguard section at the front here with that seam that they put in there that's been that's invented the notably the sights are completely different so the an has this very distinctive wheel shaped rear sight that you turn you get your aperture by turning to the next blade. On this one it's a conventional rear aperture that just sits on top. The front sight is a fully shrouded protected arrangement with this sort of trapezoidal uh, or hexagonal shape. On this it's an open top. I don't really know why they've called it the AN-94 when they could have called it something else but probably because people aren't as nerdy as me and they won't notice or care about the differences and so the, the name recognition still matters. The only change that really matters from a functional point of view I would suggest is this muzzle device because to the best of my knowledge this distinctive twin chamber sort of cyclone muzzle device is actually essential to getting sufficient back pressure for this gun inside a gun to actually function. This, this default kind of looks like a Bulgarian muzzle device, AK style muzzle device, wouldn't necessarily op allow the gun to operate correctly. This is uh, an Italian design, but it's uh, part of Italy that was basically a puppet state of Germany in the Second World War. I don't think that's particularly relevant, except for sort of context. It's clearly not a German or German-inspired design, I don't think. Although I suppose it's not necessarily characteristically Italian either. It's a bit of an oddball. It is it's not a ballpup, but it is a compact design. So with the magazine forming the pistol grip, you are... Uh, abbreviating the length of the weapon. Got something to show you. Um, it's not the OG-43, it's the OG-44. So this was the follow-up, which is much more conventional. This version is not in Call of Duty, but it's the closest thing we have, and it's relatively rare in its own right. It also allows me to illustrate what I mean by it being shorter. So if I put the magazine back in, this works conventionally. So this has a pistol grip here. By moving the trigger guard to this position, I'm making the whole thing substantially shorter, several inches shorter. So why they went sort of backwards to a longer design, I'm not quite sure. It functions, I believe, pretty similarly. The cocking handle is on the top. Uh, it is open bolt, as the gun in the game is depicted as being. However, I'm not seeing the bolt forward when the player runs out of ammunition, which is what we'd expect. We'd expect the bolt to be in that condition. And then recocked ready for firing and every subsequent shot so i'm not sure that's been quite correctly modeled but we don't have one of these so maybe it's a quirk oh that's horrible truly horrible so the base gun here is a real design uh, frustratingly call of duty has given it a, a fictional name of cooper rifle it's actually the thompson hyde model 1944 which is effectively a stamped sheet metal version of a Tommy gun in 30 carbine, so the M1 carbine cartridge. It's experimental, didn't go anywhere. Almost a surprise that it didn't really. You could you could absolutely see the um, America in the 1950s using this as their replacement for the 
for the Thompson. But it didn't happen. It's a uh, very rare prototype. We haven't got one. We have the Hyde rifle, but not the Thompson Hyde. And then I've been presented with, as is tradition, a truly horrific modified version with bodged handguards from something. I'm not, I can't even recognize what those are. Uh, we've got a sort of outrigger foregrip thing sprouting out of the magazine well. A large coffin-shaped magazine, weird grip, optical sight, and a comedy charm. I've seen worse, but uh, it's still not great. Right, the ever-popular Accuracy International. This is, I think, meant to be... It, it has styling cues from the later Accuracy Internationals, but I think it's meant to be the PM, or Precision Marksman, which you will perhaps know better as the British L96A1. Now, the this has, as I, as I mentioned, it has some of the... The stock is a bit closer to the, mo the more modern design with the uh, plastic insert here for the for the hand grip. And it has a muzzle brake on it, or at least this version does, and a Picatinny rail. When the L96 was invented, that standardized Picatinny slash NATO rail, or even, um, even the Weaver equivalent, was not, um, not available. So this has a standard sort of dovetail sight. So you need a specific mount for it. This was designed as a sniper rifle from the ground up, and it was very good. And only replaced by a bigger Accuracy International rifle, the L115, which is still in service, and that's in 338 lap of a Magnum. This is in 762, which I think is what the, uh, the COD rifle is supposed to be in. Five round magazine. And the reason I've chosen this one is that we actually fired this for filming of the new series of Loadout, which is coming soon on this very channel. So look out for that. Uh, this is a sort of extremely cursed P90, both in its redesign, its inexplicable, maybe anime-inspired redesign, and then, of course, somebody has decorated it. So it still has the P90 cocking handles, the version of the magazine catch. The magazine is weird. The, I don't like that sort of reverse outrigger sight mount. I think there's a reason why the P90 has the bridge over the top of the receiver to stabilize the sights. Uh, the whole thing just looks like a toy. Right, I'm getting uh, pink mist, and not the sort of pink mist that I usually associate with um, the use of firearms. Just generic neon pink mist when we hit the enemy, almost like some sort of paintball effect. I think the tracer fire as well. I mean, you don't get tracer fire out of firearms unless you put tracer ammunition in them, but regardless, for this gun, it's pink. It's unspeakable, really. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a Second World War weapon, P the PTRS-41, as in 1941. Semi-automatic, 14.5 by 114 millimeters. That's a very long, very powerful round. And they are still around and they're still useful because they will penetrate hard cover vehicles. And the, the Call of Duty rendition is pretty good in terms of how it looks. I would have grabbed ours to show you, but I physically couldn't do it. Now, the main thing I, I learned from that, other than I should never be a soldier, is there is no way in heck that even a very strong, well-trained individual can carry that around and run and gun with it. Absolutely no way. The balance, the weight of this thing, the length of this thing, the version in, in the game is definitely shorter by, by about a foot or more than the real thing just not plausible it's, and it's not designed for that it's a, essentially a crew served weapon or at least a, a two-man team and you have to post up with it in a hard point or on the ground at least and try to engage your vehicles or your aircraft on the ground or whatever it is you're trying to attack you absolutely cannot use it in the way that the, the game depicts Now this is a, a bit of a surprise, I wasn't aware that this had been introduced, and it's sort of one of these. This is the Italian uh, Breda PG 1935 self-loading rifle. A really important and very rare museum firearm here, but you'll notice that it is, as well as being Italian, the one in the game is the Costa Rican version. This uses the Carcano, it's, it's in 6.5 Carcano, on-block clip system, just like the 
the bolt action rifles did. So it doesn't have the detachable magazine that would really cramp your style in a Call of Duty game. Nor does it have the four round burst automatic feature which we saw represented there. So you've got a, I don't know if it had a 24 round magazine, I'd have to look that up, um, but it, you, you know, multiples of, of four, I suppose that would make sense. And you see that four rounds are expended every time you fire the weapon in game. The basic design is the same though. The gun in the game is different in a lot of details. I'd have to go and check <laughs> some sources to see if they've deliberately departed from the design as they sometimes do. But the big blocky receiver is there, the sliding dust cover on the top. And one of the major features of this that they have correctly modeled, very complicated looking bolt in here, is its open bolt. Like a lot of submachine guns, you fire it from an open bolt, and this one is semi-automatic only. Intriguingly, it also has the name Antonucci carved into the wooden stock. Maybe that's not a soldier's name? Need to look into this. But as far as I knew, they were not general issue, so um, I need to do a bit of research on that. Quite a nice looking gun there, I think, with the mixture of the wooden furniture and the sort of blackened steel. It looks like a G3, and it's the sort of daddy of the G3. It's the set me. They're a weird sort of alternate universe H and K <laughs> range of products. Nowhere near as varied or successful as Hecker and Koch, but very, really quite similar because same original designer. Here it's a semi semi fictionalized version, but it's, it's pretty close to the real thing. Even the model number is is a close reference. So C58 refers to set me, and 58 refers to model uh, model 58. So 1958 is when it's finalized. I think this is supposed to be the model C, which is a 70s incremental improvement on the original, by which time the G3 is already in existence over in Germany. So that means we get the standard or version of the standard H&K reload with the, the famous slap, but they've gone for the judo chop version, which is doable on those rifles because they have bigger surface area to hit than the little plastic half moon shape nubbin on the MP5, which if you chop it with the edge of your hand is likely to hurt. I'm struggling to wrap my head around why there is a directed energy weapon in a call, any Call of Duty game, because as far, to the best of my knowledge, we never got far enough into the future for such a thing to be remotely plausible. Especially this one, which it's, at this point has been fitted with the ludicrous pseudo World War II optical sight. I mean, why they'd be designing future guns to, to take a fictional Second World War red dot sight, I don't know. Overall design, it looks pretty cool. It looks like maybe something from something Weta Workshop might come up with, and that's a compliment by the way. It's just horrifically out of place in any of the Call of Duty games that are currently in existence to my knowledge. The the, the charge up constant beam phase Star Trek phaser style effect, if I'm going to have a laser gun I do quite like that idea, it reminds me of Half-Life, but uh, yeah, wh why is it in Call of Duty guys? That's... yeah. Uh, the Burger Town classic. Yeah, what can I say? Not much. Vaguely horrific with the sort of meat texture. So this is <laughs> this is sort of the SA VZ25. This is the Czechoslovakian Cold War era submachine gun. The 25 is in 9x19, and it has the 25 that is has this uh, pull and fold, and then press in the latch on the butt plate section to latch it into place and there it go so you can use that as a foregrip. The Call of Duty version is quite different. The front half is, is pretty close. The cocking handle is different. It's a, it's a completely different shape. Um, open bolt operation, it's got that right. But then the back half, the stock is attached almost like a, like a well rod grip with tabs and two screws, not with this all enveloping rear sight section here, which is a more robust setup. And then this rear sight that, I'm, that I don't like is replaced by a standard aperture rear sight with protectors on it. So they've changed up the back end of the gun. The proportions look different too. Other details are, are changed. I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but I, if, if you're trying to replicate an historical firearm, replicate it.
Next up is a drunken firearms designer's take on the French FAMAS assault rifle. With the rail, with the chopped down upper receiver with the rail, it's more like the Valorise, the modernized FAMAS, but it definitely has the air of something. It, they've nailed the Cold War sheet metal look, but of course the FAMAS is not all sheet metal, it has substantial polymer in it. I can't quite tell if they're trying to replicate that or not. Suffice to say, it doesn't, if you were to map this over a FAMAS, it isn't really much of a match. It's highly stylized. It has the folding built-in bipod down the side of the receiver. It has an impression of the grenade launching ring on the barrel, which is what those grooves and the uh, ring that slides up and down them is. The flash hider is comically large. Not sure why that's so big. And the proportions of the receiver, as I say, do not really match the FAMAS very well at all. I guess that's why they called it the FAFAR and not the FAMAS. It's the FN SCAR, Special Operations Forces Combat Assault Rifle, or abbreviations along those lines. There's, there's at least one other. Yeah, not far off, not a bad effort. Once again, it has been changed up. Even things like how many screws there are in the side, the fact that the upper receiver looks like it's made out of the same material as the buttstock and the pistol grip, i.e. polymer, when in fact it's uh, machined aluminium or aluminum, if you prefer. The lower receiver uh, on, in the on the game version has the reinforcing rib down the side, which is an, arm, an AR feature, not on the scar. Notice it's not there. The magazine is pretty bang on, although even then they've changed the shape of the rubber bumper. Why? Why change it? Don't know. But the overall impression is pretty close. The more you look, the more difference you see. This is, this is a, becoming a theme with Call of Duty weapons. So three vents either side at the front on the real thing, one big slot on the fictional version. Gas block's not a million miles away, but then the barrel has the step cut in it that the M4 has. And uh, there's no need for that because the grenade launcher for this attaches to the Picatinny rail on the bottom. And that notch is specifically for the grenade launcher because it was designed to fit around an M16A1 barrel, not an M16A2 barrel, which is why the M4 has to have the notch because the M16A2 had an M16A1 profile barrel under the handguard. So you took the handguards off, you mounted your grenade launcher with the shroud around it, job done. The SCAR doesn't need a barrel of that profile. Right, well, I, I was oddly pleased to see this because I really love the design and it's a gun we don't have. This is the Dumontier patent knife revolver. Anyway, I love it because the barrel and the blade are forged together. It's the blade is forged from the barrel. So it's it really, some of them are really beautiful. This one, arguable, it's a little bit decorated, but nice if weird thing to have in a game. And then when we, we open it up, we, you know, it's a break action design, which I don't think they actually were. There might be one out there, but they're typically a solid frame gate loading design. So we, we've, we've seen it chuck out all its cases through the side of its solid cylinder and then it breaks open and all the same cases come flying out. So it's very clearly just an oversight. They've left in, they've based it on the model of something else that does eject empty cases and they've just left that animation in. got an unusual one very unusual to be running around with that's that's the major criticism you can level at this this is not a gun that you would like to be running around with this is the Marlin model 1917 here it's been adapted a bit like I suppose a Vickers gas operated gun as a sort of infantry gun but you can see from the big mounting lugs on the receiver there that it's that's not what it's designed for so it's actually quite nice to see something in a game that I haven't seen before. And I think they've actually modelled it well. I haven't been able to get hold of one to compare. The blued steel looks really good with wear and damage to it, but also still the shine. At this time, they're still lovingly finishing things with a, with a lovely shiny blue finish. Very soon into the Second World War, that goes out the window and everyone is kind of phosphating or painting things. All right, we've come to the end of another Call of Duty Warzone video, and we've survived 
mostly intact. A few horrors in there. Very much appreciate you watching as always. Please do come and visit one of our three museums here in the UK. We do have our own YouTube channel, which we've been uh, shamelessly um, borrowing you lovely people for <laughs> to come and come and watch please do carry on doing that we also have uh, several social social media outlets that you may wish to engage with but otherwise we will see you again next week thanks again for watching mm -hmm.